Well, Jim, that was indeed night one of WrestleMania 38. And of course, what would WrestleMania be without a night two of WrestleMania 38? A lot better. In Dallas, Texas. And well, I guess let's start like that, like I did with night one. Jim, what did you think overall of night two? Well, they started again with America the Beautiful. This was Jesse Jane Decker. Whoever that, where do they find these artists? Nashville. They're in, ta- they're in Texas. They're not in Nashville. I know. She's a country music. I'd, have you heard of her doing anything ever? Yeah, she was married, or she is married to a football player. And also she was like the spokesperson for one of those diet pills. She was all over commercials for a few years there. Ah, well, see, I've never been on a diet. Fortunately, I've been able to keep my girlish figure. But anyway, America, you know, the song was written about Abdullah the Butcher. What? You didn't know this? No, I did not know this. Oh, beautiful forks in the eyes and gig marks on the head. So after that. <laughs> oh, the hold on. <laughs> did you just come up with that? Yeah. Wow. Impressive. I just, you know, it was better than what she was doing. Option two was, was this a song you sang in the locker room years ago? <laughs> <laughs> no, that was a Christmas carol I wrote about the road warriors. They like that. <laughs> Diving through the ropes to get out of the fucking way. Here they come again. Taters all the way. Ha ha ha. <laughs> so anyway, then they had an open package with Mark Wahlberg. And I get, he has something to do with wrestling somehow. I'm guessing maybe Nick Khan was his agent. I'm not exactly sure what he had to do with any okay. of this other than they want to get celebrities involved. Well, he called it the most stupendous two-night WrestleMania in history. How many two-night WrestleManias have there been now? Is this the second or the third? It's one or the other. I'm not even certain. So history don't don't last as long as it used to. Then Triple H came out, and at least this was better than Stephanie, because they really wanted to see Triple H. And he did the big entrance and spit, and he milked it forever. Because, again, he deserved it. He didn't get to do a retirement match because of the happenings, so this was his moment. And, you know, the people wanted, that's what I'm saying, the people wanted to see the 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 former stars and icons and people of the previous generation just come out to the do an entrance and stand there and talk to them as much as they wanted to see any of the matches involving any of the new people. And I re- when time on pay-per-view was actually valuable, when WrestleMania or anything else, we had two hours and 50 minutes or elsewise the fucking finish of the main event was going to get cut off of a lot of cable systems and you were going to have to give a lot of money back. Vince would have a cow on the entrances and the milking and the stalling that they can do now just because time matters not. And they've got a massive pay-per-view window. They can go over four hours and the peacock doesn't care. So, but he did the re- welcome to WrestleMania and the pyro and he left his boots and microphone in the ring, which was kind of a nice touch. And then we go to three teams who... Almost every one of them, except for Randy Orton, should leave their boots in the ring. The tag team, one of the tag team titles, was on the line in a triple threat match. RK Bro, Orton and Riddle, the Street Profits, and the Alpha Academy. Do you remember I mentioned, when we were talking about the previous night's festivities, I'm not going to watch any multi-man matches because then I'm just going to be sour They're not going to be any good. None of them are. Same shit over and over. We will move on. However, after the finish, Gable Stevenson, who we met the previous night, came in for a celebration with, uh, I guess, RK Bro or whatever, and he, he got in a beef with Shorty Gable and gave him, gave Shorty a belly to belly. So you got Shorty Gable and Gable Stevenson. And they're both named after Dan Gable because they were both amateur wrestlers. But in this case, Stevenson, belly to belly shorty. He was still dressed like a bum, by the way, Stevenson. 
That was that. What did I miss? Anything? I think they're pronouncing his name Steveson, not Steveson. Steves, Steveson? Steveson. Oh, boy. You know what? They need to just be like Rico Constantino. Because he actually did, did not have an N in his name. It was C-O-S instead of C-O-N-S. But everybody said it Constantino, so I just put the fucking N in. He just learned to live with it. You think he should learn to live with it? It's a weird name to say. And he'll have a butler named Jeeves. There comes Steveson and Jeeves. And if Jeeves' son was to be in there, there's Steveson and Jeeves' son. Let's move on. Bobby Lashley, what have you done to deserve what you are about to receive? I was so scared about this. And after we saw it, there was good reason to be. It wasn't... It wasn't as bad as I had envisioned because almost nothing could be, and the finish, thankfully, was the right finish. But my God, have they now, have they given up on almost? Have they said, okay, fuck it. We're seeing what everybody else is seeing. Let's cut bait and run. What do you think? I don't know. I mean, that, <laughs> that suplex was interesting. It just... Okay, the the way to have this match, in my opinion, would have been to not to have it. That's a, the only thing I can come up with because, yes, Lashley needs a win and needs to be his image rehabilitated somewhat after he got beat and then he was concussed and couldn't be in the elimination chamber and he needs to come back looking good. But... I feel like, number one, I missed something. He was still a heel and still with MVP when he got carried out of the Elimination Chamber, right? In Saudi Arabia, that's right. In Saudi Arabia. Did MVP get out of Saudi Arabia? Maybe that's what they're covering up. They're trying to misdirect us, because where's MVP? He's still over there. They've got him tied up in a closet, and they're pissing on him. Because... All of a sudden, this heel, the leader of the hurt business, the guy that's been hurt locking everybody, and MVP's his manager, and he's a heel, and suddenly he's gone, and he comes back, MVP's nowhere to be found, and he's mad at almost that we don't know whether they've ever even met, but they're pointing at the WrestleMania sign. What did I miss in Bobby Lashley's life that caused him to fire his manager and change his ways. It turns out it was less a concussion than one of those situations in an old movie where someone bonks their head and they say, what's going on? What are these people doing here? Why am I living my life this way? I need to go back to who I am. And uh, that's why there's no more Hurt Business MVP or good qualities to Bobby Lashley's on-screen character. <laughs> so what you're saying is somebody needs to take a ball-peen hammer and bop him again and it comes back. Then he remembers. There's been no explanation other than he needed a match. We want to get him on the show. He's healthy enough. We have nothing else for almost. Let's get him out there. All of a sudden, as a baby face. There was no turn. It was just he appeared weeks after he had previously appeared as a different person. Okay, on the other side of the coin, Vince McMahon loves Giants. He loved Andre. He loved the big show. He loved Mabel at one point. He loves big guys. And obviously, they have pro overprotected almost to the point where he has been impervious to anybody and just lays waste to people, handicap matches, whatever. The only way that I could explain this match and finish is if Vince has decided, you know what? Not only is he not any good, he ain't going to get there. Because Vince, the Vince McMahon that I knew would never have beaten a giant like that with the build that he's had if unless he had soured on the whole thing i mean i i know when he got on when his dad got andre andre had already been in the business what seven eight years and he knew how to work and and there wasn't the the odd just standing around that lost that almost exhibits but everybody had to know he would be a project. So perhaps this project has come to an end. What giant has Vince McMahon gotten right since Andre? 
Giant Gonzalez was put into a furry bodysuit. Well, but now he was already limited physically on. with what he could do. No, yeah, you, no, you can't. You bring in the giant, the big show from WCW. They immediately gave him a stupid name and took whatever, whatever energy he had coming off WCW TV. They got off him pretty quickly, right? And but he now floundered you, you for can't years. Blame anybody on Giant Gonzalez, poor Jorge. He was a wonderful person, but that was unsalvageable. But go ahead. If I went to you or Bill Watts or Eddie Graham, not to put you in their league, but you get what I'm saying. If I went to any of you and said, hey, I got this guy. He's eight feet tall. He can't do anything. He can't talk. Taught him to do a few things. Is there anything you can do to hide everything and get a payoff out of him? Yes. Well, they didn't do that. No, they haven't done that. It, but it, it's called stealing a pay-per-view or stealing a house or stealing a gate. We've talked about it before. You, somebody that's that visual. And that size, don't even put them in matches. Just have them walk out and fucking pick somebody up and throw them away three or four weeks in a row and then get them involved in somebody that has, uh, so, with somebody that has enough experience to get by with something short and sell tickets to it. And the idea is you're probably not going to see that fucking giant again. So again, going back to my question, and there's been others, Giant Silva... There's been Dabo Cato. There's been various other people throughout the years. Uh, great Kali. What giant oh, has boy. Vince McMahon ever done right or booked right or done anything really smart with since Andre? Because even the big show has been nothing but, was nothing but missed opportunities to me for a long time. Yeah, you got me there, I guess. Well, anyway, almost, almost made it. But here was this match. I sat down, I started watching it. And I was waiting for something to critique. and. It was some flat-footed punching and almost squeezing Bobby Lashley's head. I'm squeezing your head. I'm squeezing your head. And then at one point, Lashley's in the corner and almost charges in and ran right past Lashley and ran into the turnbuckle on his own, of his own accord. <laughs> and Lashley's like, where the fuck do you go? And then... They set up to do it again, and this time Bobby moved in the same same place. Bobby moved. It was like, take two. And then poor Lashley, he got to make a comeback on the guy while the guy was leaning over the top rope, looking like he was trying to puke over the top out onto the floor. He was just leaning over the top rope, and Bobby Lashley is hitting him in the back. That was a comeback. And then... Lashley tried to put the hurt lock on him, but couldn't get it. And I actually wrote, where is Giant Gonzalez? Um, Almost picked him up in a fireman's carry and just didn't drop him accidentally, but just dropped him. That was a move, I guess. A long bear hug. A snap suplex by Lashley onto almost. So right there. I mean, it wasn't a vertical suplex, but still, if you're suplexing the seven foot four, four hundred pound giant, his time is coming near. And then finally, I've seen this twice now, and I don't understand it. A spear to the back. I saw it in this match, and I saw it in Reigns and Brock. Wasn't it Reigns and Brock? Or was it, uh, yeah, it was Reigns and Brock. Well, anyway. He spear Lashley speared the giant in the back. And they crump and then he hit him with another spear in the front. One, two, three. Thanks for coming almost. I if the object was to get Bobby Lashley a good win, this was not a good win. It was a win. Wasn't a good one. He looks worse than he ever Lashley looks worse than he ever has by working with this guy who can't do anything. And if the object was to bury almost, well, I guess they did that. Explain this one to me, Lucy. Well, again, I can't explain it. And going to my previous comments about giants, I can't say that this is for sure the write-off of almost or not, because they book giants poorly. Almost lost, <laughs> went off his feet. <laughs> So I guess that's it with him and Lashley. Uh, I don't know what they're going to do with him now. And 
if they just put him right back with MVP and make him a heel again, then what was the point of this whole thing? So they can't be doing that. But otherwise, why not keep MVP? He's one of the best talkers they have. This was, look, night two wasn't great. And at times it was awful. And it was a string of just a multi-man match and this. You were just waiting for things to kind of get going. And it, it took a very, very long time. It took an old man taking a stunner for it to happen. <laughs> Well, and even that was getting going in a preposterous direction. Uh, that will be remembered forever because of the the absurdity of it. But um, speaking of absurdity, let's go ahead and get this one out of the way. I got to be honest with you. When I got up on Sunday morning, or Monday morning rather, today, and was going to watch the Sunday night festivities, I did get on the internet. I didn't get on the internet Friday night, Saturday morning until I watched Ring of Honor because I didn't want the FTR Briscoes match to be spoiled. And I didn't look in advance at the Saturday night WrestleMania because I didn't have time and I thought, okay, you know, it's going to be okay. But I did peek and everybody on Twitter, I think I almost trended again Generally, now I don't even have to do anything to trend on Twitter. It's just people saying, well, wait till Cornette sees this. And I trend somehow that way. But everybody was like, oh, we've got to hear what Cornette's going to say about Johnny Knoxville and Sami Zayn. And that's when I thought, what the fuck? So I have to watch this. Because normally I would have said, okay. You watched it? Yes, I watched it. Because wow. Because people... Well, everybody was like, it, 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 it meant so much to them, apparently, that they weren't the only ones that had to suffer through this abomination, that I would somehow watch it and articulate the things on our platform here that they are not able to say in public places because it stunk, it was rotten, it was fucking abominable, and people were offended by it. So, okay, I'll watch it. Because, I mean, that's kind of the attitude I was going to have with it anyway. I just didn't plan on critiquing the whole thing. But all I could think, just even when they started, before they'd ever even got into it, just when the bell was ringing, after the entrances, Sami Zayn, a good old El Generico, and Kevin Owens, Kevin Steen, I've said this before, in Ring of Honor, they were the pains in the ass. We had a great talent roster. They worked hard. They mostly showed up on time. Nobody was really fucking up too bad. It's just that every time that you had to talk to either one of these two, maybe it had something to do because they were French Canadian. Maybe it had something to do because they're friends and birds of a feather, a feather flock together or birds of a feather shit together, whatever the saying is. But they were the biggest pains in the ass. They always had some questions some issues some conflict something need to be resolved i think i've told everybody zane sent delirious a two and a half page single spaced email one time talking about trying to get his airport parking paid for by the company in montreal it was just incessant and they always had something to say about everybody else's business including they thought my wrestling acumen, booking, whatever, it was cheesy. It was cheesy. It's not like the, the young folks today want to get into. It's cheesy. It's old-fashioned. It's kind of goofy. Let me just remind everybody that this is the biggest wrestling event in the world, and Sami Zayn, Mr. Expert, is bumping like a Super Bowl for a 50-something-year-old jack-off reality TV star in the biggest abomination of a parody of a wrestling match that's ever been held by anybody. AEW don't have nothing on this bullshit because they not only made sure to make the wrestling business look like garbage, but they spent a lot of money to do it. So... You know the old the old saying, uh, Brian, the old joke? You go up to a girl, you say, will you fuck me for a million dollars? Hell yeah! 
Well, will you fuck me for a dollar? No, what do you think I am? We've already established that, now we're just haggling over price. So we've come to find out that fat boy Steen and fucking skinny boy Generico, they don't mind making complete asses out of themselves and doing the worst offensive, unfunny bullshit making fun of the wrestling business that they possibly can as long as they're getting a big check for it. Otherwise, they got principles. Fuck you both. Especially Generico, because at least Owens was in there with Stone Cold Steve Austin. So he got the better part of the deal. Fucking the red-headed ginger Muslim French Canadian here had to stooge for a goddamn brain-damaged moron. So I'm glad to see them doing well in their environment up there. My booking was cheesy. They'd have been all over. If somebody had suggested they do this before they were making the big money, oh, how dare you? But see, they won't, nobody's like me. They won't put their money where their mouth is and just say, fuck you, keep your check. That's embarrassing. I'm not going to fucking do it. Fire extinguisher, garbage can, crutch, cookie sheet. Johnny Knoxville's dressed like a kid on Halloween playing superhero, but he got somebody slipped some fucking fentanyl in his candy or something. Zane goes under the ring to pull a table out and pulls out a table covered with mouse traps. They've got a stop sign in the red. This is, this would be unprofessional by AEW standards. Like if Jelly Nutella had a match with some fucking fat, bald, tattooed, deathmatch garbage wrestler in some barn somewhere in the middle of Iowa, this is what you would get. And this is on WrestleMania. A bunch of amateurs and a goof going along with it. It actually reminded me of Omega versus Moxley from Baltimore. No. <laughs> They're very, very similar matches if you really think about it. Well, they all look the same, but this was even more visually insulting because as bad as Moxley looks like a fucking plumber laying in an alley somewhere, at least he looks like he could fight you, whereas Johnny Knoxville is big as my little finger, gray-haired, by his own admission, brain-damaged, and a complete imbecile that a bunch of mentally challenged people have supported to where he has enough money to where he can fucking go around and do shit like this. People think he's some kind of celebrity. Um, and by the way, Sami Zayn suplexed that 50 plus year old reality TV goof through a table and got a two count. And then Zayn was charging at him in the corner. Knoxville pulls up an air horn and blows it in Sami Zayn's face. It's a fucking spray can with compressed air. I've sprayed them. It won't hurt you if you do it to yourself. It's loud and annoying. So he blows the air horn and Sami Zayn is selling his ears like he's had his goddamn bell rung. And then some, I thought it was a mark. I thought it was a fan out of the crowd. Some guy comes in the ring and the announcers are calling him party boy. And he starts dancing and strips down to his thong underwear. <laughs> in the middle of the ring, in the middle of the mat, who are these fucking people? Well, he was one of the regulars on Jackass 20 years ago. Well, is this like the Howard Stern crack-addicted dwarf and the fucking juggalo insane clown bullshit whoop-whoop thing that... In a sense, in, in a sense, it's kind of like a... Um, Jackass is like the, a self-contained whack pack, I guess you could say. A whack pack? Well, that's what Howard Stern called his people, the whack pack. Oh, I thought that was when y'all got together and... Well, we won't go into that. No, that's whack bag. I thought that may be the jack pack. Uh, so... What? <laughs> whack pack, jack pack, all whatever right. you... All right, when jack. All get, when all these, when this whole pack gets together, <laughs> whatever they're doing, whacking, jacking, wagging it, wagging it, waggity whack, smacking it, smacking it, smacking it, smack. I'm gonna go where the... All right. He's gonna jack it. Um, so then... Sammy Zayn dispatched the party boy in the thong and rolled him under the ring 
and then started to go under the ring after him for some reason, but a midget came out from under the ring and beat up and body slammed Sami Zayn in the middle. He, 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 I can't say he picked him up. He picked him down. Zayn actually bent over and went down in order to be picked up by the fucking midget who body slammed him. And then Johnny Knoxville gets a two count on a professional wrestler with a DDT. The midget does not leave. His name is Wee Man. Well, I don't care if he's if he's got a fucking bladder issue. His, his incontinence is a problem. This is not the time to talk about it, but he shouldn't have been on WrestleMania. They take forever to pull out something. It's a metal frame with a fake leg attached to it and on the bottom of the fake leg on the foot of the fake leg is a shoe of some description or a boot or whatever so they set that up zane comes over and potatoed the fucking midget in the face full with a kick i mean they showed a replay he just kicked that fucking midget in the face and it's the only time i've ever really wanted to thank sammy zane for doing anything so the midget got the potato then Zane goes to the top rope to jump off on Johnny Knoxville, but Johnny Knoxville has a remote control in his hand, and while he's laying there, he reaches up in the air so everybody can see it, and he pushes a button, and Pyro blows up off the ring post up Sami Zayn's sphincter. He burned him right in his taintal area, and he takes the bump off the ropes, and then they get a bowling ball and roll the bowling ball into Sami Zayn's nut. What is these ridiculous, mentally challenged, emotionally stunted goofballs fascination with hitting each other or other people in the fucking nuts? And on purpose, and they they you've seen the clips in the past over the years, they go along with this shit. I have never once in my life for a bet, for a dare, or for any other reason, allowed somebody to just full force haul off and either hit me, kick me, or drive something into my fucking testicles. Because you could get hurt that way, and it's stupid. I know that the things that they do here in public, they're obviously not using Mr. Johnson and his two friends for anything else, because what woman would cooperate with that but why damage the goods when it's not necessary? So then they, after the bowling ball, they got the leg machine and had the leg machine kick him in the nuts while they're all holding it. And it's anybody over the age of seven who watches or likes Jackass, Johnny Knoxville, or any of this fucking activity in a wrestling match is a complete fucking moron. Let me just make that blanket statement right now and somebody try to prove me wrong so this wouldn't end zane took a slam off the well actually he just flipped himself he was on the top rope and johnny knoxville reaches up and zane just dives off does a forward flip and goes through the mousetrap table to the concrete floor could have killed himself they, they, anything that they were doing here could have ended in serious injury and he's in there with a bunch of amateurs and it and then all of the the jackasses bring a giant mouse trap into the i'm talking six feet long mouse trap that they've built specifically for this bring it in the ring put Sami Zayn on it and then Johnny Knoxville can't figure out how to set the fucking trap off on Zane and reached over and got in the middle of it and and exposed it when he pushes the button. The wooden, instead of a real mousetrap, which the metal spring that clamps down on the poor little fella, it's just a big wooden thing and it flies up and hits Johnny Knoxville in the back of the head and bounces off, and he pulls back, and then it slams down on Sami Zayn, and oh, he, and he's selling, and he's pinned in the fucking mousetrap. One, two, three. I've said that they're risking injury, and 
Unfortunately, in this case, because everybody deserved it here, but unfortunately, the only thing that was hurt in this match was the wrestling business. So, night one, we, we left with optimism. By this point in the show, it's not even half over, and not only was I saying, oh, fuck, but I had to stop watching this thing. I Because I, I didn't want to see any more. Even the stuff I wanted to see. After this, I didn't want to see any of it. I was... Actually, I would have been happy right then if I never saw any wrestling ever again. And it's not like that anybody else really felt any different from what I saw on the internet, from what I saw on Twitter. All the wrestling fans were insulted. Everybody said, I can't wait to hear Cornette tear this apart. People are giving it negative stars or fucking laughing about it in the wrong way. Why? Just to get... I can understand if it was goddamn The Rock as a movie star or Mick Jagger or some upper echelon, my God, we'll never get the opportunity to have a, a guy of this level of fame and magnitude on our show ever again. We'll do whatever to get him. Johnny fucking Knoxville? I, I, Johnny Knoxville's presence on this show cannot have added... I don't think it could have added anything. I don't think one single person bought it because of this. They, maybe some people turned away from it because of this. But it couldn't be worth the bad publicity, the visual of all this silliness, ruining the rest of the show for people who don't want to see any more after that, shitting on the business that the guys are about to get in the ring, the main events that drew the money, are going to get in the ring and risk their necks and their lives and their health to try to be professionals and really fucking dig in and give them a, and they do this. I, I, I'm sorry. That's, that's, this is the kind of thing that I think people that weren't even involved should quit over. Give me your thoughts. Not a big fan of it. I was able to watch it and enjoy it for the stupidity that it was because I knew what it would be. And it's Sami Zayn. It's not like they're working against Steve Austin or John Cena or Roman Reigns. Oh, you would have thought that's who they were about 10 years ago before they got their attitudes adjusted and told how to do things the right way. You're right that Johnny Knoxville is not a big star nowadays. Now, it did seem like they got a lot of people there who must have been jackass fans because when people pop a little bit for Wee Man, they are seriously deep jackass fans. Well, no, it's a visual. You out a, 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 a midget applicable of nothing, apropos of nothing, a midget comes out from under the ring and starts body slamming the wrestler. You're going to pop for that if you've never seen him before because it's fucking preposterous. Not my favorite thing on uh, WrestleMania. And hopefully that's the end of Johnny Knoxville in WWE. <sighs> well, next up. But. After, but well, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I hate to bring this up you have to think after a match like that sammy and johnny probably have a lot of nicks and cuts when they get to the back and they check themselves out especially sammy a little bit of an issue pyro to the nuts yeah that's a problem maybe there's some singed hair he needs to find a way to do away with boy i'll tell you what i was about to say that that's a hard way to control your genital hair is by setting fire to it and burning it off. I know you do that with, with, uh, you know, brush on occasion out in the prairie, you burn some brush off. I don't think you want to set your pubic hair on fire. I think there's an easier way to get rid of that unsightly hair because folks out there in podcast land, your skin, your hair, your armpits, your crotch, your taint, all those various intersections on your body deserve only the best. And that's what they've got right now in the new Ultra Premium Collection from Manscaped. This new skincare and hair care product lineup is designed to upgrade the everyday man shower routine from head to toe and from balls to the wall. Folks, I'm telling you, the Ultra Premium Body Wash with aloe vera and sea salt will keep your skin feeling clean and moisturized all day. It's, it's hair care time in the shower. You got the two-in-one shampoo and conditioner. Cleans and nourishes all in one step. It's got a base of coconut water, green tea, aloe, turmeric, 
and sage. Just don't expose this to an open flame. Once you hop out of the shower, you can protect yourself from that stanky body odor with the Manscaped Aluminum-Free Deodorant. That's right, this deodorant will not leave you smelling like a nasty old aluminum soup can, but fresh as a daisy. And it dries clear, and it's infused with the refined cologne. Then you've got the Hydrating Body Moisturizer Spray. This stuff will not only keep you moist, it'll keep you positively soaked. You'll have to wring yourself out several times every night before you go to bed because you will be containing so much moisture in your beautiful skin. And you get a free gift, the Manscaped Lip Balm. All of that in the new Ultra Premium Collection from Manscaped.com. And you want to know why all of these products, folks, are so special? Besides the fact that they make any man, even if you've come out of a septic tank, or you stink so bad that you could gag a maggot on a gut wagon or bluff a buzzard off a meat wagon. All these products are special because they use clean formulas and premium ingredients. It's cruelty-free, paraben-free, dye-free, and vegan. Cruelty-free. That means you use this stuff and you will be incapable of cruelty. Paraben-free. That means if you use this stuff, you won't have any goddamn parabens. Die free. That means you'll live forever. You will never die. And it's vegan. That means it tastes good. Folks, each one of these products also is infused with their refined cologne quality scent. So your partner, whoever he, she, or it may be, will love the signature spell. Folks, go right now to manscaped.com and use the code DRIVE, D-R-I-V-E. You can get 20% off and free shipping. 20% off and free shipping, manscaped.com. Use the code DRIVE. There are one of our longest-lasting sponsors, one of the folks' favorites. You love all of their items and implements and products, and now you'll smell and feel and look better than ever. Manscaped.com. That's right. And it's and, vegan. And it's vegan. And, of course, we just saw a giant hand. There are a lot of interesting... Incidents with hands in WWE history, but hopefully you didn't oh, fast. Oh, yeah, that's right. On, on that Johnny Knoxville thing, what was the giant hand at ringside? It was a giant hand at ringside. I don't know how else to describe <laughs> it. What was the giant hand at ringside? It's exactly what it was. <sighs> well, there you go. Anyway, so I came back after a while, and I was able to make up some time because the previous match ran me away from the program and I was running late. So the next match was for another women's tag team title, Sasha and Naomi versus Rhea Ripley and Liv Morgan versus Natty and Shayna Baszler against Carmella and Zelina. And I wrote C multi man match rule. And I wouldn't watch Brock versus reigns. If it was on right now, I was, thinking I, I might sell all of my wrestling videos after seeing that previous match. One so, question I have for you, and maybe you'll, next time you see them, you'll be able to figure it out, but I was watching this, and I've had the thought a couple times recently. Is the gimmick that Liv Morgan and Rhea Ripley are fucking, or just that they're friends? Because it went from, like, they're teaming up, now they're, like, they're going to hump each other on TV, I think, within a few <laughs> weeks. I saw the entrance and I saw that they were dressed provocatively. I have I it's not that I've given up on Rhea Ripley, it's just that she's always in multiple girl matches or in some flunky position on Raw with all these other girls I don't give a shit about and they're not doing anything with her and I don't I, I I'm just I'm going to wait until so I'm not frustrated and I'm not screaming what the fuck's the matter with you people at the TV screen? Like when Ripley was wrestling Nikki Ass, her cosplaying teenage sidekick. Uh, I'm going to wait until they decide to do something with her with Bianca or Becky or Charlotte or this or any of the other couple of top girls and not bother if, if, if they're not going to be bothered with the most the the person with the most potential on their female roster. Charlotte's already a star. Ronda Rousey's probably as over as she's going to get. It may be downhill from here. Bianca and Becky are over. 
Rhea Ripley for the future has more potential than any girl I've seen in the business. I think actually she ought to drop wrestling and go straight into movies because she looks like $25 million. But I'm not going to sit and watch her scuffle with seven other interchangeable mid-level girls. Your thoughts? I gave it six stars. I thought it was incredible, and we saw breathtaking moves, the likes of which we have never seen. I, I don't remember too much about the match, to be quite yeah, honest. Yeah, okay. We're going to go to AJ Styles and Edge, and this is where I feel bad. Because I even wrote, I've got such a bad taste in my mouth now after the Johnny Knoxville thing. I was just looking at the clock. Here's AJ Styles and Edge. Even if Edge lost his mind and became went from a family man baby face to a fucking horrible heel for no reason, and whatever the lead up has been to this, AJ's a great talent in the ring, so is Edge. And... Normally, I would have thought this should be good, and I would be looking forward to it. I was looking at the clock, and I wrote, how much longer on this fucking show? Because I was just so disgusted by what I'd seen before. So, it wasn't fair to these guys. I'm not going to knock it. Because, to be honest, I got up to piss and forgot to hit pause. And then, as I was coming back in, Hotchkiss called with an update on the action figure inventory. And finally, I came back in, and AJ was giving Edge a superplex off of the turnbuckle onto the ring apron, and that wasn't the finish. I'm like, oh, now they're trying to kill themselves. Um, Damian Priest was out there at ringside. He looks different now. I guess he's a heel now, and he's associating with Edge. AJ goes for a springboard, but Damian Priest distracted him by standing there. So instead of AJ just going on about his business because he's in a fight, he stared at the guy that was standing there minding his own business at ringside, then went for the springboard. Edge hit a spear in midair, one, two, three. I bet this was a really good fucking match. But as I said, after Johnny Knoxville, I just wanted this whole thing to be over and done with. How was it, Brian? I didn't like it that much. And, <laughs> and I know a lot of people did. I, I have not. You were I thought you were going to say, oh my God, it was great. You missed it. It was fantastic. No, you know what? I have not gotten into the Edge return, especially the last several months. I've kind of gotten sick of him. I don't like the new personality he just randomly developed in the last month. I wasn't into the promos, the theatrical ones he started doing. Whatever it is, I couldn't get into this match. I'm not going to blame it on the Knoxville match. I don't think it was that at all. And I love night one. But there was nothing about Edge and AJ Styles that made me interested in it. I think it's their fault for a bad job of booking the weeks leading up to the match, but I didn't care about the match and I've gotten sick of edge. Talent works hard, but it's not, they're not supported by the creative or the presentation. And <laughs> anyway, they announced the attendance 78,453. Of course, that's counting all the comps and the employees. Actually, ticket purchasing patrons, there was 1,347. Seamus and Ridge Holland, with their little dog Butch, wrestled the New Day for two minutes. Because <laughs> apparently they bumped that off night one and put it in a night two and then gave them two minutes. Why? And for a lot of people, they go, well, at least they got to be on WrestleMania. Mark thinking. If I'm going to be on WrestleMania, but I only have two minutes, there's no way to have a good fucking match. There's no way that it's anything but blah, get them in, get them out. I don't want to be seen like that on the biggest show in the entire year. I'll wait till they can give me some time to do something or elsewise I'll just be over now. Is, is it now that just everybody wants to be in these battle royals or wants to be in these 60-second matches or whatever just so they can say they were on the show? Well, everyone does want to be on WrestleMania, and um, in regards to this match specifically, the New Day have for a long time been one of my least favorite acts in the history of wrestling. Because <laughs> uh, I'm not a child, and I don't have a moron sense of humor, I guess. I've never liked the New Day. 
Sheamus has kind of bored me for a long time. Ridge Holland hasn't shown me much. However, the two minutes they were out there were great <laughs> because of Butch. This has become the most ridiculous character. And the fact that Vince must like it, that they keep doing it. Pete Dunne is smaller than everyone in the match. And the entire match, someone has to hold him. It's like Roughhouse Fargo. The entire yeah. match, someone has to hold him <laughs> or keep track of him or keep him away from people. I am getting a kick out of that, I have to say. But again, you say, I'm sorry, as a professional... If you just know, okay, I'm never going anywhere and I'm never going to do anything. I'm not going to be a big deal, but I get to be on WrestleMania. I'll just be in a 60-second match or thrown out in a battle royal or whatever. Okay, I get that. But if you ever have been anyone or, exp or have the confidence that you can ever be anyone, then you don't want to just be thrown into a battle royal. You don't just want to be thrown into a 60-second match exactly because it's the biggest show of the year that more people are going to see this than anything else. I don't want to be seen looking like a fucking goof. So that's the way I, you know, I remember in, in some cases when we started, uh, Crockett started doing the, the pay-per-views and or the live clash of champions, there were timing issues, yes, but there was never a situation where any kind of top guys or top match was told to go out, go out and be, be done in 60 seconds. That was for TV, the syndicated TV, where we'd make our entrance, look at the job guys, and Tommy Young would say, go home, while we were taking our jackets off. That was TV. That's one thing. But I... I, I... Anyway. So two minutes. Uh, I, I Again, I'd left this. I came back. I zipped through this stuff. And now, finally, we get to something else that we can pay some attention to. Vince McMahon makes his entrance. And he had a little bit more of the Vince walk going there than he did the other night at the Hall of Fame. He gives Austin Theory the big intro. And down he comes, and then here come the Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders again. Okay, I guess this works because Pat McAfee played pro football. So Not for Dallas. Not for Dallas, but it's football cheerleaders. The other uh, night one, they were just out there just dancing for no reason. But anyway, so the match is going to be McAfee against Theory Vince's at ringside. And again, just like Logan Paul, he took Pat McAfee took this seriously. He's already he's trained, as we've talked about. He trained with Rip Rogers, and he's worked out with a lot of these guys. And he takes the business seriously. And he was excellent. And Theory, uh, you know, we, we, they, they talked about it, and as we find out at the finish when they did what they did, there was discussion, obviously, of Vince having a match with McAfee. We see now that whatever reservations and whoever voiced them were correct that they should not do that, but they should do something else to get to that. But this is an example where Theory, even though he gets beat, he's, feet, he's Vince McMahon's flunky slash protege. He's in a high-profile match with a mainstream sports guy at WrestleMania. And we know he can work. He's fucking brilliant, Theory. So this was better than it had any right to be because you've got McAfee's had three matches in front of people now, right? And they, they brought it and they worked it out and they knocked it out of the park. I thought back and forth, but McAfee did a great job. Did when he goes for a superplex theory, shoves him off the top rope. He backflips to the middle, lands on his feet, runs leaps up to the top rope in one leap and does the superplex, that was smoother than anybody in the wrestling business would have done something like that. If you remember, when he had that match with Adam Cole a couple of years ago, yeah, and it was an empty arena match, and we talked about not only how good he was, but there was something he did that was very similar, where he ran and he jumped on the top rope, and it was so impressive. And I remember at the time we said, imagine if he actually did that in a room with people in it. They would go crazy. It would look amazing. Well, there you go. And he finally <laughs> did it. And again, that, that got a two count and a big pop. And then 
Theory took over. He tried to go for his finish, and McAfee got out of it and rolled him up. One, two, three, and got a huge pop because Theory already has heat because he is doing the bidding of the evil Mr. McMahon. And that's where they were going with that thing the whole time, and, and it worked. And then, okay, we thought, well, this is over with, and then Vince does the thing where he starts to take his jacket off. And then he thinks better of it, and he starts to walk away, and then he turns back around, and then he takes the jacket off and the tie. And then he unbuttons his cuffs, and he unbuttons his collar, and he takes off his shirt. And I'm thinking, fuck, if he goes any further, I know this is pay-per-view, but they should have charged more money. But finally, he gets in the ring, and... <sighs> oh, I have to... I know that everybody was thrilled to see because it's Vince and it's the WrestleMania crowd and heel, baby face, good, bad, whatever. They want to see the stars. They want to see the people they never get to see in person. Vince hadn't been involved in something like this in a long time. So they were looking with the rose-colored glasses, the fans in the building, uh, anybody watching television or whatever. But I don't... Was it sad to see this? Or was it... Was it fun because it's Vince McMahon or was it sad because it's, it's not, it's Vince McMahon and it's not the same Vince. The stuff with him in Austin was fun to see. The stuff from the moment he took his shirt off and got in the ring was sad to see up until yeah. Austin came out and he's in better shape than most 76 year olds ever, but he's, well, yes. but as soon as he took his shirt off, that was also the first time we've seen Vince's old man arms. Yeah. He was an old man. I mean, you could tell he was an old man, and that clothesline. I mean, as soon as he started doing stuff, he's like, oh, no. Like I said, they needed to do something with him in Austin. It was the right thing to do. They probably should have ended the night with it. Well, yeah, but... But I also, beyond the way Vince looked and how sad that was, I also wouldn't have had him go in there and beat McAfee after McAfee just won a match. Well, that's that's the thing. The stuff with Austin, except for the unfortunate stunner, the stuff with Austin was all beer drinking and gaga and pantomime or whatever. If, if he was going to have a match here, why couldn't he have had a manager match for a minute and a half? Because the thing I didn't understand from the start was Vince and McAfee are facing off and trash talking or whatever. And theory comes from behind and blisters Pat McAfee and knocks him goofy from behind. And that's when Vince says, ring the bell to the referee and should have taken over and got on him. But instead, he stood there and let McAfee get back up. Well, then what was the point of having the heel hit him from behind to get you an advantage? Now you're face to face again. McAfee runs at Vince. And by God, it was like he had no rotator cuffs. Vince just threw an arm out and McAfee ran into it and took a bump. That was a clothesline. And then... Vince runs McAfee's head into the turnbuckle, and it didn't look like the words that I just described. And then another stationary clothesline where McAfee's running into him and he's just holding his arm up. I know he's 76, but that is one of the reasons why that maybe this shouldn't have happened this way. Another head to the turnbuckle. Snail's pace, and Vince keeps letting McAfee get up and recover and look at him and get up and then he'll do something else to him and McAfee's got to sell. What's he going to do? Now, nah, Vince, time for me to come back. And Theory tripped him and crotched uh, McAfee and crotched his nuts on the ring post and so Vince could strut around and then he was giving him, <laughs> it looked like our little dog pockets. We give him the soft little kicks in the midsection and he wasn't trying to like he was kicking the shit out of him. He was doing the insulting kicks but Maybe he's doing the insulting kicks because that's one thing about Austin. He's been wearing two knee braces for bad ACLs for 25 years. When you kick with your right foot, your left foot, that's why I don't kick anymore like I used to. Your left foot is landing with a lot of force and you can fuck your knee up. Well, Vince had two torn, torn quads, so he wasn't stomping at all. 
It's not the same as just lifting weights when you're in the ring with the mat moving and, and balance being and impact from different places. Go ahead. What? I was going to say he tore his quads a long time ago. Well, yeah, but that that's what I'm saying. He was fucking mid fifties and tore his quads rolling in the ring. Now he's 76 and he's going to start throwing fucking kicks and look like flair or somebody. No, this was low impact shit because his tendons, sinews, muscles, connecting tissue, whatever, is all almost 80 years old. At least what hadn't been replaced previously. But anyway, so after the crotch on the, the post, Theory gives Vince a football, and Vince teases kicking it into the crowd. And I know he's having fun and teasing and milking, but I can tell just by the body language, and he might never admit this, but McAfee was down there going, why am I having to sell so fucking long? Will you please come over here? And finally, he Vince teases kicking the, the football into the crowd and instead just kicks it into McAfee's midsection and covers him one, two, three, and then kicked him out to the floor like a piece of garbage. We'll talk about what happened after that in a second, and we've given our thoughts about whether Vince should or shouldn't be in there. But if you are going to do this, and word got out, and then people thought it wasn't going to happen because they set up the Austin Theory match, although it always seemed like there was some kind of hidden agenda behind the whole thing, although that was never spelled out. In storyline, it doesn't make any sense why Vince all of a sudden wanted to wrestle a match with McAfee. But if you were going to do this, it absolutely would have meant a lot more to WrestleMania to get people to check it out casually if you announced that 76-year-old Vince McMahon was going to wrestle. A pro football player. A pro football player who's pretty popular outside of wrestling, too. But, you know, it, it, I was thinking ahead of time that maybe it was Vince that said, we can't advertise this as a match because I can't do enough to give the people their money's worth, make it right or whatever. So let's put theory in and then we'll do something. But then once he got in there, the match bell to bell, even though a lot didn't happen, it was slow. It lasted minutes. And it, like I said, a manager match, the fucking heel nails McAfee and down he goes. Vince gets on him on top of him on the mount, punches him several times, puts the boots to him a little bit. Chokes him over the rope, rakes his eyes. McAfee tries to bow up a little bit, and that's when Theory pulls a leg from behind, and Vince gets on him again and maybe grabs something, wraps it around his neck, starts choking him. Or just staying on him like a fucking... Like a guy who can't fight would stay on a guy who can fight if the guy who can fight was down. And then finally, either Vince misses something he's trying to do or McAfee just bows up. And boom, 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 McAfee makes a little bit of a comeback on a couple of things that Vince might be able to do. I'm not talking about bumps or whatever. But then let Theory pop up, and there McAfee, because he's just... McAfee just had that match with Theory. I mean, it's not like that they've made up and everything. So, and McAfee won, so Theory's still mad. Theory could pop up. And McAfee could give him a couple of bumps and turn around into something that Vince has in his hand, or maybe Theory can hit McAfee with something from behind, and Vince falls on him. How did I beat any major pro wrestler that I ever beat? It was all from the heel doing the damage and me falling on the unconscious body and then crowing about it like I did something. But... He beat him and kicked him out on the floor. And then Vince and Austin Theory celebrated what seemed like forever until the glass broke. And then again, I mean, obviously, the people go crazy. Here comes Steve Austin. He's in the ring. He's face-to-face -face with Vince McMahon. He beats up Austin Theory. He gives Austin Theory a stunner. Austin Theory took four bumps on the same stunner. That he was, was like, that, I was like, you're swimming in midair. Yes, it was great. He, he went straight up, straight back, but bumped up forwards and flipped. And I, anyway, he wanted to make sure that he made the most of that when that's the first and last stunner that Austin Theory will ever take. It's like being figure forward by Flair or 
pile driven by Lawler or, you know, spinning toehold by Funk or whatever. It's an honor. So then Vince weasels out. They do the facials and the interplay with him and Austin. Now let's have a beer. And as soon as they go to have the beer. <laughs> and folks, if you haven't seen the clip, it's all over Twitter. Mick Foley even shot his live reaction to it and put it on Twitter. Austin kicks Vince in the stomach to set up the stunner. When he kicked Vince in the stomach, Vince either not thinking or potentially off balance went down to one knee on his right knee instead of just bending over. So since the stunner is kick and grab in kind of the same motion, Austin kicks Vince and goes to grab where his he thinks his head is going to be, but Vince has gone down to a knee and Austin reaches over the top of him. There's no head there. Well, now Vince realizes what's happened, and he tries to get back up to his feet. Well, now Austin is grabbing for him, but when Vince pushes himself up to his feet, he gets overbalanced and he staggers backwards into the ropes. Austin goes and grand. Austin is trying to get his Vince's head in his hands, and Vince is trying to feed back to Austin, but they're not sinking up in the middle. That's why I said earlier in the show it looked like Muhammad Ali at the peak of his fucking powers dodging punches of his opponents except it was vince accidentally not letting austin grab him around the fucking head and finally austin grabs him and just and they're in the corner and austin's already starting to laugh and by that point he just sits down with the stunner and vince instead of going to his knees went to his ass and they all collapsed in a heap <laughs> it looked like a monkey fucking a football and Austin spit all of his beer out because he's like, this is the most preposterous and gets up laughing his ass off. Cause he's like, he just fell on his ass in Texas stadium in front of 70 something thousand people because Vince couldn't stand up straight. He hit the stunner and give him credit <laughs> from the moment he first tried to hit it. He had beer in his mouth. He was yeah. waiting. So the whole yes. time Vince is doing the rope and dope, he's holding the beer in his mouth. And when he finally hits it, like I said, the greatest visual ever. Vince, you can't even see where his legs are. Yeah. <laughs> he just looks like a torso in pain. And right in front of him is Austin spitting the beer out. <laughs> it's the funniest fucking picture of all time. It looked like Austin gave a stunner to the legless man in the AEW Battle Royal. It's just... It's... <laughs> and then so Austin gets up and he's laughing he starts calling for the beers and Vince rolled out somewhere and then Austin called McAfee in to have a beer with him and drag and then gave a guess I guess he figured I've that can't be the last one I ever do so he calls McAfee in and drinks beer with him and then gives him a hell of a stunner and McAfee what a what he took a completely different style of bump where he got knocked backwards up on tiptoes, froze, and then collapsed. Uh, but at least the last stunner that we will see was a good one, but the next to last one is the one that a lot of people, especially the boys in the business, are going to remember. It it was worse, worse than Linda's, wasn't it? It was, and remember what I said to you before, everything was kind of cool, came full circle, including the fact that Vince's first stunner and his last <laughs> stunner were the two worst stunners of all time. That's right. He couldn't get the first one either, could he? He sold it really weird. This one, again, <laughs> we've seen the stunner now for 25, 30 years, and I've never seen anyone go down more than that way. All right, come on just now. Just looking at the picture of Vince with Austin in front of him on Splash Mountain. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's hey, let's be a little serious for a second. Maybe. Maybe. You bought... WrestleMania the old-fashioned way on pay-per-view, and you feel a little ripped off by night two, especially <laughs> the old man who can't take the stunner, and you want to sue. Maybe, maybe, just maybe, maybe you might even be more upset 
because you've actually bought stock in this publicly traded company and you've just had your first look at the guy in charge, the person running this thing. And you say, now, no, I got to get my money back. I got to sue. One way or another, folks, you need a lawyer. Call Stephen P. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, if you have been taken on some of this WWE stock and now you see that that's the chairman, that's the guy in charge, we need our money back. Or whether you're just pissed off that you paid for this thing and you want to get your money back for that, or whether you've been damaged, harmed, or infringed upon in any other way, in or out of the wrestling industry, the man to call. Stephen P. New at newlawoffice.com, 888-692-8084. For years now, he's been the consigliere of the cult of Cornette. He's helped countless members of our listening audience out there with a variety of problems. If he can't help you, well, I won't say nobody can, but he might be able to find one. If he can't help you, he'll put you in touch with somebody. If he doesn't, if he can't do that, you're probably hopeless. But, um... I don't know, Brian. I'm wondering now, wait a minute. Think about this. Let's let's flip this around a little bit. Should Vince McMahon retain Stephen P. News Services and sue that no good, dirty, low-down, stone-cold Steve Austin for physically assaulting an elderly man? A man ready to be put away in a home somewhere and he was physically assaulted? There's a lot of different ways that these suits could go. If he's going to get Stephen P. New, I'm going to get Jerry McDivitt. I just want to declare that right now. Boy, you know what? Next year for WrestleMania. Night two. With, at night two, is hell with Johnny Knoxville. I don't even think we need Logan Paul. I think we need Jerry McDivitt versus Stephen P. New in a writ on a pole match. Not a pole match. Yes, no. yes. They put it on the pole and the first one to climb the pole and see, I know. For ladder match, match, ladder match. No, nah, well, okay, ladder match, writ. On the uh, on the top of the uh, the brass hemorrhoid pillow, and I'll tell you what I've been reading writs all morning. If you've read the writs that Stephen P. New has written, you'll know they're really well written writs. But he can take care of you regardless of whether you need to be written or written off, folks. Again, Stephen P. New, NewLawOffice dot com eight 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 six nine two eight zero eight four. He can defend you from anything except bad memories of a stinky WrestleMania match. That's right, and. Jim, I did say before that I thought the Vince McMahon, Steve Austin thing should have been the close of night two. That should have been the ending of WrestleMania, even though traditionally the world title match should be. Of course, it wasn't the ending. There was more of WrestleMania. Well, you know, and they were in kind of a sticky situation here because I agree Vince McMahon and Steve Austin in the ring together for the first time in almost 20 years should have closed the show, but they couldn't put the match on that got us to that point after the Roman Reigns Brock Lesnar match. So I see, I see what their dilemma was, but the, this, this is the one that drew the money. This is the one we've been waiting to see. And remember Brian, just the last week or two, I said a lot of times in fans minds, when they hear a matchup, they think they want to see it more than they actually do when they see it. Yeah. Well, I was victim of the same thing because I've been thinking, okay, I want to see Reigns and Brock. And now that I saw both nights, I wanted to see Cody and Seth. I didn't know I wanted to see Becky and Bianca, but I enjoyed it. Um, I wanted to see what was going to go on with Vince and Austin and Theory and whatever. But this is the match they sold it on. I think I've kind of seen this match. Is that the way it came off to you? It, it wasn't. These guys don't need to go a long time. They don't need to have a 30 minute match and an intricate scientific extravaganza. That's neither one of these guys style. 
And this was a Paul Heyman spectacular. The big guys with the big moves that are over, pulling them out in unexpected ways. But I feel like at this point that we've kind of seen this match. Did you feel the same way, even though we haven't? I mean, they've wrestled, what, two or three years ago? They wrestled at WrestleMania. Wasn't that the match where the report was? Could be wrong. Wasn't it Roman versus Brock where Roman didn't win the belt and Sika and a few other people in the crowd? The, the report was they got really upset and we're going to tear things up. Yes. <laughs> what Was that New Orleans? I thought that was the Bay Area. Might have been San Francisco. But we've I just, seen. I always want everything to happen in New Orleans. I know. I don't understand this, but we've seen this kind of match. And actually, I thought for me, and again, I was a little tired. Night one was good. Night two, not as good. And we just saw an incredible moment. Wasn't really ready for this match. And this was all that was left. And it brought back bad memories of for a while, Brock was doing. I thought Brock was relying too much on the Suplex City shit of just throwing the guy overhead. And then doing it again over and over. And the guy I always think about in my head, him doing that to the most is Roman. And here he was doing it again. Well, it, at the start of the match, by the way, did you notice, is Paul now coloring what's left of his hair? I believe he did, yeah. It Because it, it seemed like normally I, when I see him, his his hair kind of fades gradually into his bald spot which is the majority of his head. But here, there was there was a clear line of demarcation between jet black hair and white, bald skin. This is title versus title. And that's another reason why a unification match is always a big deal. Um, they Back in the 70s, when they did some with the NWA and WWWF titles with Dusty and Superstar Graham and Harley and Superstar, that was a big deal to the fans who were not even smart back then that there was no way either one of those belts was going to change hands. But it was a unification. The two champions were going to settle this. That's always a big deal. I thought it hurt it that they're fighting for two identical championship belts. They're just different colors. Just the big jeweled W. The belts are all genetic. They all look the same. Just different colors for their different brands. So that kind of hurt. But th this was a fight. It was big guys, and it was it was the kind of match they need to have. Again, it's not like either one of these guys need to be doing flying head scissors. And it, it, you know, and they had the big, the big high impact moments. Uh, Paulie's begging off from Brock on the floor. It was all Roman Reigns' idea. I didn't have anything to do with it. I love you. And then Reigns comes and spears Brock through the barricade. And Brock barely beats the count, and he hit, gets hit with a spear by Reigns, and two count. And Reigns comes with the Superman punches, but Brock gets up and starts the Germans, three Germans, four Germans, more Germans than they had on Hogan's Heroes. And they just went back and forth with big moves. Brock got the F5 in finally for a two count. Went for the another F5. Roman goes for the... Now everybody is going for the eyes. Have you noticed this? How many times have you seen this over this week? When somebody gets picked up for a finish, they reach down and gouge the eyes. Well, imagine that. Who could have ever thought of that? That'd be the first thing I'd think of. Motherfucker, I'll blind your ass. He speared Brock into the referee and then hit Brock with a nut shot and then hit Brock with the title belt <laughs> and got a two count when the referee... It came back around, and then he hit the ropes. It, it, this is the one. Remember the other spear in the back on Lashley and almost. Reigns hits the ropes. Lesnar is in the middle of the ring, staggering. Reigns hits the ropes one side, goes to the other side, hits those, comes off like Brock is going to turn around and he's going to spear him. I think Brock thought that he was coming off one more side of the ropes, and I think that Roman was going for the spear and realized about the point of no return that he's going to spear Brock in the back, but he speared him in the back. <laughs> and then on the second spear, as soon as he got speared, Brock grabbed a double wrist lock, the Kimura, the young folks call it. Luthez's favorite hold. And uh, Reigns made the ropes. The thing about, as we've talked about, it is the big high impact, you know, match that, 
they lay out with guys like this and they just hit things one after another. But in this, Brock is proving he not only can sell much better than anybody gives him credit for, I'm not, I'm not just talking selling by going down and taking a bump. I'm talking facially and showing the pain and you can hear the pain. But his work, so after all this time, has he wrestled more than 10 times in any calendar year since the late 2000s? Uh, if he has, it would be just slightly over that amount. So it, his work is still surprisingly good for a guy that that doesn't do this very often. Whatever you want to say about Brock, it seems like he's always taken his stuff, especially since he made a comeback, takes his stuff seriously. He never goes in there and dogs it. His stuff is serious. No, and and even when, you know, when he's said that he didn't like the business back in, remember when he quit the first time, he didn't want to be like one of those old guys, you know, broke down and he's drinking vodka and blah, 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 and limping to his plane to go home at night, just like all of us did back in the old days, limp to our plane and then fly home. Um, But he never got in the ring and did silly bullshit or did anything to make it, make it look to the people like he didn't give a shit about the business or care about it or make it look phony or whatever. We've never said that about him, just that he was not enamored of the business as a lifestyle to begin with. But he's always... And it... It just makes sense if he's the top guy in a, a hard sport, then that makes him look better than if he's the top guy in a bunch of bullshit. So that's another reason why the main event stars not only always try to take care of the ones who deserve to be main event stars, not the ones that are put there by amateur bookers, always try to make the business look serious and dangerous and et cetera, because it makes them look better they're on top of it if you've if you reign supreme in a bunch of fucking phony bullshit then you're just the top phony bullshitter however having said that at that point paul is begging for roman reigns to get up my tribal chief get up <laughs> what a fucking toady he is i love him and lesnar goes for another f5 and reigns drops behind and hits him with a spear one, two, three. This shit comes out of nowhere more often than not anymore. Well, I will say, apparently Roman Reigns was legitimately hurt, so they went to the finish early is what I'm hearing. Oh, okay. When did this come in? I have not been made aware of this. Remember when he said my shoulder's out? Apparently his shoulder was out. Oh, shit. Well, then he was telling the truth, wasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> so... What took his shoulder out? The, which move then do we suspect? Because it was right before that. Was it Was it the double wrist lock? It may have been the Kimura, yeah. Did he fucking double wrist lock Roman Reigns and pop his shoulder out of the socket? He must have, Brock must have had a flashback to the NCAA tournament. It don't take much, and that, that's why the double wrist lock is the go-to move for every shooter and hooker since the dawn of wrestling, because it doesn't take much at all. I could probably, if he would allow me to apply it to him, I'm not saying I'd get it on my own, but if he say, hey, put this hold on me, I could probably, if I strained hard, pop Roman Reigns' shoulder out with a double wrist lock, because it don't take much. So, well, maybe that's why it was a little sudden. But I thought that after all the stuff that had gone on, Brock goes for the F5, Reigns drops behind, hits the rope, spears him one, two, three, but it was the only winner possible. Brock is part-time. Reigns, they've, they've had so much invested in. He's the face of the company. Uh, so the result was the right thing to do. Um, it may be, but then we, maybe we shouldn't be too hard on the match if uh, they had more more to go. Now I got to go back and watch. Yeah, and see. me too. I thought that he was just talking to Paul and working, but he's like, yeah, now my shoulder's out. I'll be done for the evening over here. Thank you. Nice of you to come. Please tip the waitress on the way out. I thought the same thing. And then when he was trying to lift the belt with both hands and he was struggling, I said, oh, wow, he's doing a great job of selling. Here. You know what? I didn't even pay any attention to that part. He tried to lift, you know, one belt in each arm and he couldn't get the one arm up and he struggled with oh. it. And eventually he got it, which made me think, oh. 
okay, he's doing a good job of selling it. And this morning I've seen reports and we got to look further into it to make sure that he may have legitimately been hurt. Well, if he was struggling to lift that belt up when he just won the main event at WrestleMania over Brock Lesnar, I, I think even, even if he's a pro, he probably wasn't selling on purpose at that point. And uh, he may have done more damage doing that because if the the last thing you want to do with a separated shoulder or a bad AC joint or whatever is lift your arm straight up in the air. That's the last thing you want to be trying to do. Well, there you go. Hey, <laughs> we don't need no stinking operations. We'll just pop it back in ourselves. Well, that well, was WrestleMania. It, sh it certainly was. And, uh, you know, I think if if they'd have eliminated, uh, and obviously if they'd gone to one night, they would have lost millions of dollars in the gross and et cetera, et cetera. But just judging purely on the quality of the show, there was a good four hours, a really good four hour show in the middle of that eight, eight hours. And if if they'd just gone with more of the good stuff and less of the bad stuff, that could have been one of the better shows that they've done in years and years and years. But spread out over two days with the just the time, just the time, just the time, and then throwing in Johnny Knoxville and almost and a couple other things, it it got brutal there for a while. 